All right, well, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending upon where you are in this world, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, your moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. We have a great webinar on tap today, but before we get started with it, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, event today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of the event, you will be able to access it on demand. We're going to be sending out an email to everybody who registered with a link to take you to the webinar on demand. We're also going to be taking questions from the audience. So at any time during the presentation, if you have a question for our panelists, please don't wait. You can use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your question at any time. And we'll take probably about 10 minutes or so near the end of the presentation. And we'll go over those audience questions at that time. All right, with that, we'll go ahead and kick off today's webinar, which is DevSecOps, Finding the Adversaries in Our Mist. Sounds like a Tom Clancy novel. Our speakers today is Shannon Leitz, who is DevSecOps leader at Intuit, and James Wickett, who is head of research at Signal Sciences. Hey, guys, welcome to the webinar. Thanks for joining me. All Thanks right. Thanks for thank having us here. Okay, great. Yeah, well, James, you. I know you're going to be driving that slide deck, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you now. All right. Yeah, you know, I just want to say thank you for everyone for showing up. Uh, we are really excited about this topic. Um, let, let's introduce ourselves real quick. Uh, Shannon, you want to uh, uh, start us off? Yeah, just a quick nugget about me. I have been working in this industry for about 30 years now. Um, I'm the primary founder of DevSecOps and Hacker Girl. Um, I work at Intuit. I'm an IONS faculty. I like to build comic strips on the side and do some of that through white labeling and have been um, started out as a developer, uh, pretty much have been doing DevSecOps and, you know, at some point in the future, hopefully discussing more about Rugged. All right. Thanks, James. All right. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I work over at Signal Sciences. Um, and I have uh, several courses in the uh, Dev on DevOps uh, and DevOps and security over in the LinkedIn Learning or the Lynda.com uh, catalog. Uh, and I, I live in Austin, Texas, and uh, help organize, and I've been doing it for, for many years now, the uh, DevOps Days uh, Austin event. So uh, if you're ever looking for a cool DevOps Days event to come by, uh, hey, come think about Austin. We'd love to have you. We've got a good barbecue. So uh, uh, Shannon, uh, today you know we're, we're talking about a problem uh, that we see uh, that we've both kind of noticed throughout the industry, right? It's that, uh, and, and uh, we'll, let's classify it as kind of a threefold problem, and then we're kind of drive into the topic. But uh, you know, dev and operations and securities, uh, they, they all operate as silos. Uh, that's been something that we've continued to notice. We're seeing a lot of that breakdown in different uh, places, but it still it still exists. Um, along the way, over the last uh, decade of operations, like we've noticed that the the landscape of how the web uh, uh, web applications and APIs and, and uh, through microservices and all the way there, everything's structured, uh, it's dramatically shifted. And third, which I think is really important for this, this uh, topic, and uh, whenever I saw you give kind of the, ver the original version of this, I was like, oh yeah, we, we like, this is, this is totally spot on, but we are actually under attack, like for real, right? Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I think we need to understand that there are, so to kind of back that up, right, we, we see just a stereotype here of like security uh, and, and development. So developers are like, hey, you know, security, you know, they prefer a system powered off and unplugged. And they live kind of in this world where like, you know, nothing's good enough except for absolute perfection and, and disconnected from the business in any sort of meaningful capacity, right? Um, security would be fine if like we just shut all the doors and let's just stop right which is which is a horrible like stereotype for security no one wants to hear that right and then um, but security is often accused of or often will verbalize uh, stuff like oh those stupid developers they don't know how to write something you know oh you know we're still finding cross-site scripting in our app or whatever right and they they sort of they uh, they malign uh, they malign the developers and uh, and that's that's a real problem as well and to uh, justify like our next point, like uh, web applications uh, have evolved. So uh, this is specifically about web application firewalls and, and a, just a little quote here from Gardner. But we see like over the last decade, the way um, that, that applications have changed and then the way we're defending them, um, it, it has to shift as well. Um, so 
I love this quote, and uh, Shannon, let's let's kind of talk about this for a second. Um, this is from Stephen Belovin from uh, Thinking Security. Uh, he has this quote. He says, "Companies are spending a great deal on security, but we read of massive computer-related attacks uh, all the time, really. And so clearly something is wrong. And he says the root of the problem is twofold: we're protecting the wrong things, and we're hurting productivity in the process." So that uh, resonates so much. Right, uh, and I think that's that's the key. Um, uh, that's a, that's the key to like, how do we fix this as as our industry? And then I saw you uh, give this give a version of this talk over at the RSA, and you know you and I have been friends for many years now. But um, I love kind of the work you've been doing. But I I think that your approach to how you're doing adversary driven stuff, um, and and kind of thinking about it as from an adversarial lens like that starts to change the conversation in real concrete ways for developers, for operations and for security. So can you kind of help clue us in by like what what the work is you've been doing on adversary stuff? Yeah, um, you know, one of the things that um, kind of resonated with me at one point in my career was a developer speaking out saying, why would I fix all these things? And asking the question really in earnest to say, you're asking me to fix thousands of things they all seem really um, low priority and some of them you know technically don't have any adversary interests so why would i listen to you and reprioritize my backlog um, how do i make better decisions and, and ultimately that led to this um you know desire on my part to figure out you know why do we ask people to fix everything that gets pumped out that's basically hygiene related are we really thinking that perfect applications is the end goal? And if it's not perfect, then then what is the end goal? And ultimately, you know, that led to a lot of interesting conversations. And this person was somebody who was like, I'm gonna push back on you, not because I think you suck as a security professional, but because I really want you to think about what the value is that you're gonna to provide to me as a person who helps um, make decisions with me about where we're gonna spend our effort and how we're gonna you know, do the hard work of balancing objectives. And when we started looking at that together, and it was kind of a joint endeavor, um, I realized that one of the things that was really um, something we had to change about how we were talking to each other was, it wasn't just about giving you know, lists and checklists of things to do, but actually talking about what adversaries are interested in. There's three things that you know, adversary perspective really is built upon. It's the means, motives, and opportunity um, that are associated with adversaries that are super important and impactful. And when you look at an adversary, you look at their profile, we talk in the industry about opportunities. Weaknesses are opportunities, defects are opportunities, but seldom do we talk about their motive and their means. Like, are they actually interested in the things that are opportunities that we're finding in our own applications? And ultimately, you know, do they have the means to do anything with it? And when working through this, the one question that I got down to that I thought was super impactful was, well, how many adversaries does your application have? And that really changed the tone of the conversation to really kind of be more mindful about this notion of means, motive, and opportunities. You can have all of these issues in your applications, but um, I think, you know, <laughs> James, you actually talked about it earlier, and, and we mentioned a little bit about if a, if a tree falls in a forest and no one hears that, um, you know, did it still fall? I, I think it's kind of something along the same lines, and this means that, we have to, as an industry from a security side, be able to really articulate which opportunities, which defects need to be fixed, in what order, how fast, and truly deliver those to the backlog so that they can be worked as more planned work. So that's kind of the beginning of this discussion and some of the reasons why the research came together. Yeah, that's right. We mentioned that and we were kind of doing a call before this, but we were discussing like security uh, tries to, like if you had just, uh, you know, there's a locking, uh, locking a door but no one necessarily ever will maybe even try to, to uh, you know, gain entry through that, through that way. But, and, and I think you mentioned this earlier too, it's like uh, security sort of fits into that role where they kind of pursue uh, uh, you know, a full per perfection in, um, in the way the application is written. So there's no, um, no potential you know, vulnerabilities or anything like that inside of it. Yet um, you're basically asking for a bug-free application, and we know like that's an impossible that's an impossibility, right? 
um, because uh, vulnerabilities are just bugs that that end up getting exploited. So uh, I, I find this really interesting because it gives you that ability to like prioritize what what people actually care about, where, where, um, where how an adversary might actually you know attack you, right? Yeah, actually, and and I think that has made it so that the research around um, understanding adversaries better, really articulating it is, you know, going back to the checklist and telling somebody what they need to work on. We've had compliance requirements for years. There's been more and growing requirements. I think when I last worked with somebody who was trying to minimize and create a minimum viable checklist for compliance, it was like in the 300 control range. That's just um, really difficult when you're trying to develop something and, and be, um, you know, customer driven in your approach using some of the agile methods, you know, how do you iterate on security in the right fashion? So I think, you know, there's three um, issues to articulate here. Uh, are we, you know, for, for the current issues, are they the right issues? Are we articulating the right list of things to do? Are we ultimately, is testing driving us to the right issues? Like, are we actually testing the right things? Or are they the same things that adversaries are testing? And then ultimately, are we using the right tools? And you know, these three dimensions are super powerful in articulating the problem because um, when thinking about what it was gonna take to really solve the question of, are we asking people to do the right things for their application to defend them against adversaries to ultimately create the security needed to make that application resilient? The question of resilience is, is around these dimensions. It's not just you know saying we're gonna know. Um, so that kind of started this process. How will we know? Okay, yeah. And I think for me, I'm data driven. So one of the things that um, I was really interested in is there's a quote from Tennessee Williams, the night of the iguana. Um, you know, it's basically the proof around how will we know and ensuring, you know, um, you know, guessing isn't knowing. And I think guessing isn't knowing has kind of been sort of an approach I've been thinking about for a really long time. I think that when I got started in security, there was discussion about adversaries, but suddenly in the landscape, it kind of left and compliance came in and it was really, it, it felt like more of a guess to me. And so a lot of my dedication has been around trying to bring uh, the research and data back to be able to justify the, the workload and ultimately prioritize the right work to get ahead of adversaries so there isn't an ROI that's actually attractive for them. Hmm. Yeah, you know, and that's that's a good point, right? Our industry did take a turn towards compliance, you know, uh, in the the mid '90s, right, and and onward. And then um, I, I like that 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 thinking of moving back towards uh, towards the adversaries. So uh, let me see. Yeah, I feel like the pendulum swung really hard. It was like any scanner that pumped out anything required immediate attention. SLAs were kind of off. Um, and developers tend to have their own SLAs. They want to make sure that their application's up and um, reliable and all of the different things around resilience. And so security being a resilience measure, like how do we deal with that? Um, I think that the dimensions of the proof that I went through to, to really drive this research was, you know, we need to understand the application as adversaries. I think this is around kind of threat modeling and attack maps. And um, my team works on attack maps and some folks do threat models, but ultimately those have to be part of how you prove that the work that you're doing is meaningful and valuable. And ultimately identifying adversary trends and capabilities is something that's gonna come from those maps. And then ultimately the next piece is like, are we measuring the right things? Are we tracking the right results? Um, getting the right metrics in place to determine if you're really moving the needle against bad guys, that's effective in trying to move you from one dimension to another. And then um the ultimate is correcting continuously so one of the things that i've been most passionate about in my career is devsecops and trying to get things to be continuous and evolving and really making it so that people are remediating the most important things within the pipeline as part of their value creation process making security a value instead of a cost converting it from work that's done at the end to work that's done at the beginning shifting left and and making it so people can make better decisions so hopefully that kind of helps uh, create the the framework for the research that we're going to share today. Uh, whoops, here. I, so I, yeah, so let's start with like number one, right? Like know your application. Um, oh, oh, you skipped over Wait, multiple I, slides, man. It, yeah, it, it, no, it's like it jumped on me. So. Um, oh, oh, okay, it jumped I, on I, you. I think, I think on on this one, like it's important to talk about like what 
Which yeah, let me that? let me talk about this for a minute because, you know, this is a Signal Sciences webinar, and I'm really proud that I've got a great relationship with Signal Sciences, and um, you guys have kind of taken some of my uh, grouchy requirements in and um, helped to further the product to help us against adversaries. But I think that it's really important to mention that the research that I've done has been conducted with many different um, providers, vendors, and and partners. You know, I've I've leveraged tools like Qualys and White Hat, Tenable, Rapid Seven gone through and looked at OWASP tools. We've leveraged things like Burp uh, Suite. You know, there's a lot of different dimensions to this peach fuzzer. So those scanners are really impactful to help you to, to determine if you're testing the right things. When you're running a scanner, trying to find the pattern that you're running to determine is the bad guy actually using the same capabilities? Am I missing some scan capability when I'm looking at the pattern of an adversary and, and really articulating that? Um, one of the other things to realize is that we kind of create honey all the time and we're always working on something like uh, for us it was impactful to create a site that almost looked like a WordPress site we get tons of WordPress attacks on a honey pot that's actually built on Joomla so you can imagine that's kind of strange um, but the signatures that it gives off are, are really making it so that um, we're getting interesting information back that adversaries are leveraging certain types of details and information to be able to run you know scanners and also other tools against our, our application that we leverage for this research and then finally detection like I don't think my research would actually be very valuable if it hadn't have had telemetry and instrumentation that there wasn't a way to actually query the information in a really interesting way to be able to take large swaths um, you know multiple days and be able to do those at speed and be able to constantly dig in and understand and articulate the payload of an attack such that um, we were able to look at, are we really susceptible? What's the error code being returned? And getting into the dimensions of what's a bad guy really doing and helping to trace that from one application to another. Those are all really critical to this kind of research because now you're actually talking about truly understanding your adversaries, getting into the dimension of 1%, being adversary driven in your um, considerations. And ultimately, if you're doing adversary driven decisions, you're looking for making bad look bad instead of trying to figure out how to make something perfect and trying to determine the anomalies associated with it. In this way, your attack map actually identifies and articulates something that is bad and you're really instrumenting for bad so that you have that juxtaposition between customer-driven innovation and adversary-driven capability. Hmm. Yeah, I, I like that. You know, um, I, you know, signal science is, you know, we're, we're really uh, happy to be part of this research and be part of it. Like so, um, we do, you know, thank them for kind of, you know, allowing this opportunity to do this talk. Um, but I think your, I think you know, your kind of layout here, like, is is really interesting because it helps drive the data behind, um, behind all this research, right? So. Yeah, like I said, none of my research would be anywhere without all of the community. So super proud of um, all the people that have really contributed these tools and helped make um, the adversary problem understood every day. Hmm. Without their passion, we wouldn't be able to chase away bad guys. Okay, so let, let's walk. Let's walk through a little bit of this. Um... Yeah, let's let's go through the first part of it. So again, I you know I'm kind of a provocateur um, in some of my approaches, and I was I was actually dieting at one point and realized I was reading a nutrition label and said this is super impactful and helpful for me. How could I use this to create security facts? And so this was like maybe just a little bit of dreaming that at some point in the in the near future we'd actually have a label like this about our products and services you know, so that customers could be more informed about the way in which their products are being, um, you know, cultivated. I think that this is something where, you know, having an ability to look at the lines of code, understand and how to create that vision of security is impactful in a way that allows you to, to really pull it apart there's a lot of science that goes into security and compliance behind products and services. So if you can imagine here, like, you know, knowing that your product was 92% compliant, you know, what would a customer do with that for PCI as an example? Or potentially, hey, it's got a, you know, degradation rating of an A instead of an F. Um, does that mean it degrades at a slower level? You know, all these things have a, a true return to ensuring that, um, bad guys don't necessarily have the ROI that allows them to continue to stay close to your applications and overly abuse them. So it's, that's the beginning of this. I think it's kind of the, you know, it's a provocative way of understanding your application. There's threat models, there's attack maps. I like to try and find ways to measure things and really ultimately um, make it apparent what is, I think, a priority. 
I I, uh, I laugh whenever I see the uh, expiration date on here. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I think that's I think that's wonderful, and I think it's it's um, uh, it's true. But we don't, you know, obviously we're we're away from kind of getting this this type of data about our about our apps for folks. But uh, it's, it's spot on. Um, yeah, like an expiration date. Can oh, you yeah. imagine if a library had an expiration date? That's a huge impact. Yeah, so, totally. Yeah. So let's kind of talk a little bit more about this. You know. Like, what do we know? Commonly, the things that we know about our applications is we have an attack map or a threat model. Um, you can you can have a component manifest like a gem file or a palm uh, Maven palm file. Uh, you can have understanding that how many lines of code, or even tests applied, things like compliance tests or quality tests that are being applied to code. We know some of these things. We have this information and data, and the dimensions of it are interesting. Um, you know, understanding how long it takes for somebody to create um, hygiene around their component manifest. Like I said, libraries expire, but we don't really treat them like they expire. People will actually leverage a component part that's 10 years old with lots of exploitable vulnerabilities without even really understanding it. And I think that's the mindset we wanna change. Next slide. So if we kind of come back, one of the, I think, interesting parts about doing this research and really kind of being provocative was what is it to mean to be adversary interest like how do you determine adversary interest and the reason why that's impactful is because bad guys are actually the end goal like getting them to go away not come after your application that's really the thing that we all fight for and so if i go back to my developer um, discussion around why are you asking me to do all this stuff when you narrow it down to, hey, an adversary is actually interested in your poor hygiene, that thing gets fixed pretty fast because all of a sudden it's like we're working together against the adversary. We're not working against each other anymore. I'm not trying to provide them with something that's like going to take away their productivity or um, it's going to reduce their capability of meeting their outcomes. It's going to ultimately allow them to drive for priority in the right way and create a backlog of things that are actually less of a priority. Not necessarily that they go away, but they have more time to ultimately remediate those issues. And so um, creating this dimensional analysis where, hey, if we have adversary interest on something, shouldn't we bump up the priority on that regardless of what it is? I mean, P0s need to get fixed immediately. But say you have a P1, a P2, or a P3, you have some adversary interest on it. And that could be ahead of things that don't have any adversary interest or they're well protected, mitigated. So I like to believe that this is the beginning of the conversation where you're truly allowing somebody to um, have the knowledge and the wherewithal to be able to make those decisions about what's in their backlog such that they get all of the ones with adversary interest to go away and now they can actually just go back to business as normal and security becomes planned work within their cadence and allows them to make the trade-offs necessary to do the right thing. I don't think that this is something I've seen in the industry for as long as I've been in um, the, my career. And so for me, it was kind of an aha epiphany moment and this research has really kind of backed up that, that thought process. So, and when you speak of adversary interest, Shannon, you're you're not talking about like a, uh, you know, like a whiteboard threat modeling situation where like we we perceive because this application has credit card numbers or or whatever, we think the adversaries will be interested to a certain level. This is a what you actually observe, right? This is that's right. Observability it's, it's metric. Real time observability. It's in the moment. Your application has interest these are bad guys now there's dimension to bad guys and we're going to share that as part of this research but ultimately it's happening and you're able to articulate it in a way that you can make decisions about how to defend your application not just in real time but also to take those trends and be able to upstream make um, constraint-based decisions about how you're going to protect and defend that application okay all right uh and uh we had i added in a bonus point here right it's it's uh uh, knowing in knowing your defensive capabilities. So um, instead of just um, kind of looking at you know log data as it happened you know um, five minutes ago or yesterday or whatever, um, or just kind of not understanding what what the requests are uh, you know where requests are getting blocked. So this is this is from our our friend the anonymous WAF user, um, and they, you know they just see like they can't understand why something is happening or why something is blocking. So like even just to I know like, this you're, is great your defensive posture is, is not yeah, even a known thing sometimes. 
or many times. Yeah, I, I thought this was a great ad and, and probably one that I missed in the first round of telling the story. I always tell people like, help me be better. I thought this was a great ad because I really do think that there's a part of understanding adversaries, which is knowing your defenses, like testing them out, making sure that you war game and ultimately um, determine things like there's uh, also in addition to these types of defensive capabilities where you're blocking, you could also be running things like deception, which is one of the things that I was showing in the honeypot setup uh, earlier on in the slides. You know, these are the dimensions of how you actually can start to articulate different categories of bad guys and um, blocking rules can really help you to strategize. So like if a certain set of blocking rules goes off, that, that could actually articulate, hey, I've got a new type of um, adversary, or I'm continuing to see the same type of adversary. They keep going after this dimension of my application. I need to make sure that every time I deploy, I've got better um, rule sets to help with blocking in that area because it is under attack, if you will. And so now the dimension for developers is, they understand actually what is under attack for their application in areas where they don't actually have attacks they're not seeing any adversary interest and that they can they can let that become part of a routine maintenance cycle mm. yeah. so, so the approach you know studying for a year with layering approach um, this this application that we threw out there we basically layered it up we did a bunch of um, testing associated with it on a continuous basis to try and match patterns um, there were you know, the approach had to show that the experiments didn't overlap. We wanted to make sure that we had very clean capability. Um, we looked at our measurements to evaluate for skew. So like I would say, uh, this is really hard research because there wasn't a lot to follow, that there wasn't a lot to go out and look and say, hey, they're also looking at adversary interests. We are starting to see data science pick up some of these capabilities, but the models that are out there are actually pretty old antiquated models. And we're starting to see that they're not keeping us ahead of the adversaries. Um, they're not allowing us to be able to dimensionally decide whether or not something is good, bad, or um, section it out so that we can actually deal with it. So that was interesting. And then, um, you know, we wanted to make sure that the attackers were unaware of our experiment. And I, I think that a few of the things that we found out during the experiment proved that, like the adversaries were doing things like, um, there was a new attack I saw. We were using SQL injection to do uh, RASP and WAF breaker um, capabilities. I thought that was really interesting for me. And, um, you know, the other thing that was uh, also part of this is, you know, we need to understand the motivations and methods and interests. So not just taking in that there was interest, but really understanding, like, What's the methodology, the money behind what they're doing? Are they constantly interested? Are they coming back, you know, once a year? Do they find something? And ultimately, they just kind of said, okay, I found something, and then I'm going to let it lay low. Um, we also know that, you know, quite often adversaries look for things to roll over. So they let logs roll over. They, they basically will sit on a defect or a potential defect for quite some time. So we had to make sure that um, our uh, capability actually matched their motivation methods and interests. So that's the approach to this. So, so now let's like talk about the next piece, which I think was a little bit provocative. And I'm I'm sorry to all the people who have spent um, a lifetime trying to do OWASP. This is not to to say that that work is um, any less important. I think it's very important work. But when we started evaluating the real world top ten um, attacks against the OWASP top ten. This is where I think that the developer I was talking to was really kind of like all excited about the research. And the reason why is because they said, this is exactly what I need. I really need to know what the adversaries are, uh, are concerned about, what they're going after. And I need to kind of know in what order and how to prioritize what I'm working on so that I can ultimately defeat the adversaries for my application. We did some comparative analysis against an application that was not in the same industry. We also did some analysis on um, current state trends and exploits that were in the wild. And so there's actually some dimensionality to the real world top 10 that are happening and also um, changes in the industry. So like things like subdomain takeover, which was number seven um, down the way, you know, that was really interesting for us was to see that in the logs and in the um, capabilities, 
the bad guys were actually testing things that we didn't even realize had um, an ability to be broken into because subdomain takeovers only recently became a thing. And bug bounties have offered lots of money for being able to find things like subdomain takeover, but they're not showing up in the OWASP top 10. The introduction of the cloud has really um, introduced interesting new things. Like if you're doing Lambda, command injection is pretty high in terms of like what you should be worried about. Now we know that injection flaws are at the top of the list of you know the OS top 10, but being able to really articulate the actual payloads, the actual adversaries, how many were there, how often were they hitting a site, that became um, decision data that we just didn't have in the OS top 10 to be able to articulate like this is what's gonna allow your application to defend itself. This is how you should think about prioritizing your work. And ultimately that's gonna um, give you the best advantage in terms of having your application be resilient against an attacker. Kind of interesting stuff. It is, so, it is really interesting. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about the kinds of adversaries we learned about, you know, in our um, research based on our small honeypot with really limited features and capabilities, we found out that there were four types of adversaries. Um, you know, we have general scanners, like you might get hit with Shodan or um, some of the census stuff that's happening out there that becomes sort of um, interesting intel that's totally passive you don't necessarily know who's going to leverage it it is paid intel so it becomes something that allows an adversary to be anonymized in their research to understand whether they want to attack you um, researchers tend to hit your sites all the time they do a lot of like bug bounty if you have a just a responsible disclosure program you're going to invite lots of researchers to be part of the community that's going to hit your sites all the time um, I tend to believe that you want to register your researchers so that you understand how to eradicate their capabilities from something else. Um, but at the same time, it's also a, a dimension that can be um, interesting. And there's lots of people who have spent their lifetime really developing um, bug bounties. I think it's a really important part of the, the ultimate call to being resilient against your adversaries. Uh, adversaries leverage things like paid noise, so when they're doing something that's super intensive, they want to get the most ROI out of it, they tend to blow up your logs, they blow up your real-time intel capabilities, they spend a lot of ex uh, effort trying to increase, uh, increase the noise during their particular part of the attack. And, and that can be kind of another category to look for, its dimensionality to the, the thing that they're actually doing. And, and generally they work in con uh, connection with an av advanced adversary. So these are the four types to think about. There are definitely other types when you're working in specific um, industries, like you might have um, espionage associated with your categories. You might have um, in, in some governments, you're worried about other governments, so you have some of those things to be considered. I, I think it's really about really understanding your adversary pool against your application with the threats that you're most concerned about. But I can't stress enough that it's really super important to benchmark. And one of the things that um, is important to me is to be able to compare my data to others and to understand, are these lucky adversaries? Are they good? Are they targeting specifically my organization? or others, um, all those questions become part of understanding the adversary campaigns and capabilities, and ultimately getting down into being able to test ahead of them to find and remediate in the most effective way. Hmm. Yeah, so it's like knowing um, uh, knowing not just like what you possibly had, but what everybody else is facing as well, like that's part of, um, that's, that's how we can help break, th break this down. Because yeah, you know, in my mind, I'm like, well, uh, what are the types of adversaries that that I would face for you know some random application, and and it is completely different based on the application types, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, and, and so, so like motivations, yeah. the next thing. Can you imagine if you understood more about the motivations of your application? Like, um, are they farming information from your site? Is it like you become a connection to a third party or an ecosystem because you have a relationship or a trust? Um, there's motivations around information brokerage, like somebody wants to actually go and just research your site and be able to sell it to somebody else so that they can anonymize that attacker or that adversary until later on in, in some sort of kill chain. Um, there are people who, who just are interested in fame or payment, like they're going to find something associated with your application and they come to you for being able to, um, you know, post their name as, hey, I found this defect, or they're even interested in, in monetary gain. Um, 
so most adversaries also fall into two other camps, which is they're looking for continuous payment. They're actually leveraging um, your application to abuse it, to be able to get continuous payment out of it, or they're looking to try and control or structure payment. Um, they want to get long-term benefits, so they're finding ways to actually get deep, um, you know, lateral movement capabilities. They're ultimately trying to have a long-term foothold. So those motivations can be really impactful. And if you can start to understand your application from the standpoint of an adversary, I, I think that's a really important. But the other thing I would tell you that um, has really turned uh, things around for a lot of developers, because they don't think like adversaries, is I always tell people, well, then think like a victim, like what would they come after and start to <clears throat> understand that we've all been victims. And if we can find ways to understand how we're the target victim, like what makes you a target victim? What makes your application a target victim? Those become impactful in you trying to fight off the adversaries and really um, hone your um, time and um, capability towards making the adversary go away. Okay, well, now Shannon, you now map these out, right? So this is uh, the fun part of the research. So like this was the OAuth top 10. It kind of fall between perceived success, percent perceived success. Um, so this is where an adversary actually feels like they've they've won. And then the number of adversaries or IPs associated with that. And so the bubbles are kind of bigger or smaller based on it. And what we did is we mapped this out. And generally, um, the belief is, is that when you kind of lay these down and you look at them from the standpoint of how important they are on the OWASP top 10. And by the way, the OWASP top 10 doesn't denote necessarily importance by rank. Um, from what I understand, I could be wrong around that. So anybody can feel free to chime in later. Um, but I, I always thought it was by rank, but you know, that's uh, and just, like I said, a I, random assumption that I just had. So I actually am like, yeah, well, I, actually, I, I don't know. Confirmed exactly, and I couldn't find anything to articulate that. So I, there's a little bit of an assumption here that they're in order, um, and that we we should see this pattern ultimately. So if you hit the next part of this. The interesting part of this research is that if you looked at the categories and you started to think about um, where you were seeing things, like scanners tend to pool up, they have a small number of IP addresses, the perceived success is actually not there. So like you're gonna get a lot of um, false positives, you're gonna get a lot of false negatives, you're gonna get error codes associated with most of the scanners. And so the behavior tends to cluster up in that left-hand bottom corner, which means that we're not actually building tools and capabilities that allow us to see the same dimensions of what we would expect. Um, mm -hmm. And then further, like if you kind of go to the next level, the next set of behavior was actually quite interesting. Researchers also cluster under small numbers of IP addresses. They're not spending a lot of money to go out and anonymize themselves. Like it's a single IP address or two if at most, or they have some automation in the cloud or whatnot, but they tend to focus their time and effort under three different categories. And, and so that subdomain takeover was quite interesting because it means that there's a marketplace right now for subdomain takeovers and that companies are paying to have the, the knowledge there because there's not a lot of scanners that are actually able to provide that functionality at scale. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. Um, you know, also cross-site scripting, there's a lot of um, uh, researchers that are out there really spending their time cross-site scripting and, and they report those a lot of the time. So then let's talk about paid noise. Like paid noise is really interesting because it pools on the right hand side. It's where there's not a lot of perceived success. Like they're not necessarily trying to do a lot of the same attacks in the OWASP top 10, but they tend to have a lot of IPs associated with them. You do see a lot of SQL injection attempts, but most of the time now I'm, I'm tending to see trends around, like I was saying, RASP or WAF breakers, where somebody's trying to basically create a um, distraction or they're trying to get you to turn off your WAF or RASP and that has become a dimension to paid noise that I thought was really interesting. They're also just laying down tons of traffic, um, different patterns or doing things like whitelisting through whitelisting through their traffic by um, trying to assume a scanner label or a header and that information allows them to try and like hide if you will even past um, some of the traffic. So those dimensions become kind of, like I said, the paid noise aspect is, if you can eradicate that from this, you can start to see the forest of the trees. 
Hmm. And then the okay. last one that's going to pop up here is I thought the most interesting is that your advanced adversaries tend to spend a lot of time on um, feature abuse, command injection. You know, what are they ultimately motivated to do? They're ultimately ultimately motivated to find unauthorized access, to be able to leverage your application application to gain payment. Um, they're either looking for payment or data to data to convert to payment. You know, majority of the time, advanced adversaries are all about getting paid. They don't want you to find them. They tend to spend money on having a pool of different um, adversary suppliers. So not only are we building ecosystems and network effects as, um, you know, organizations that are going after customer benefit, but ultimately the bad guys are finding ways to create their ecosystems. And that becomes part of this. Uh, they do things like forceful browsing. Um, we've seen them go after things like misconfiguration. They tend to um, think about uh, what mistakes might get made and leverage those. So, so this research really kind of created this dimensionality to the data that allowed us to start to think about, wow, we're not actually chasing some of the right things. Um, we need to really reorient. And in this case, like some companies are going to have different patterns. They're going to see different types of attack trends. But ultimately, when you start to break it down in this way, it allows you to have your developer understand what patterns they should be most interested in and um, to be able to organize their remediation efforts against that specific pattern. Now, when you get new researchers, new adversaries coming in, they're gonna change some of that. But it's a, it, if you have this methodology in place where you're actually starting to look at adversary traffic and um, those patterns, it allows you to kind of start to organize the work of security in a way that becomes more planned. I, I thought one of the most impactful things I heard in 2013 was, you know, that security is unplanned, unscheduled work. And that for me made me crazy because it means that um, we're constantly pushing on people to uh, create more secure outcomes, but we haven't figured out a way to make it successful enough that it could become planned work. And so this is really an effort to become planned work. Yeah, it's, that's right. It kind of gives people some prioritization. And I, I like the how they all kind of pool up together in certain segments and you start thinking about it. And I hadn't thought about it until I saw your research, and then I was like, "Oh, that that actually kind of makes sense, right? Like the, the where they where those would land on that uh, on that chart there." Um, at at uh, Signal Sciences, like we, this is a, a slide that, that we use sometimes. It's like uh, when you look at the OWASP injection attacks and kind of that that top level, like that that is important, but we see that as like the tip of of the the problem here, uh, because we see problems like um, dealing with like account takeovers or. Um, people abusing your application, the features to like get the kind of stuff that you want. Um, those types of things are are underneath the underneath the surface that um, a lot of uh, you, you know that, that aren't being instrumented for, that aren't being checked. But those are the things that really speak the language uh, of developers, right? A big account takeover attack, like that's that's really uh, impactful to to the team, and um, it, it speaks not just the inside of the security wheelhouse, but it's that's what the developers care about as well, right? Yeah, I'm really quite surprised when, you know, um, you start talking to developers and they don't know those dimensions and they think that they need to um, understand all of the cross-site scripting and whatnot. They might even have an application that has nothing to do with cross-site scripting. They still like feel like they need to know it and look for it. And you kind of try to pull them back and say that's not really something that's actually part of the dimensions of your application, nor are adversaries even interested. It could even be as simple as like a web service. They start to get freaked out about something that they don't understand real well. Um, and I think that's the opportunity really as a security professional is, you know, my job in my mind is to be helpful in a way that allows um, my developers to work on the most important things, the most impactful things, and then move on to the next thing and to organize it against, you know, the work that they do every day. Mm, yeah, yeah, you know, I've been to developer security trainings and it's like, it's like we, we spend so much time teaching developers, like here's how you do cross-site scripting, here's how it works and all that sort of stuff. And some of that is, is valuable, but um, helping them like understand and prioritize, like um, that's where security has to cross out of kind of the security silo and into developer world to actually speak, you know, with the language they need, right? Yeah, I think it's about, making sure you're not just chasing perfect for perfect sake, that you're yeah. starting to be strategic about how you deal with your security risks. So the other thing, you know, I, um, I took a bunch of this back when I did the RSA talk 
uh, from my research and you know the scanners that were popping up you could kind of see that they they show up it's small numbers of IP addresses you can pick them up pretty easily in the in the signal sciences products so that was really helpful for us because I was starting to do this through log analysis and things like that it was really hard to see not to mention um, there were some rule sets that allowed us to kind of differentiate and so um, picking up these dimensions you could see like there was a hard bound 12 hour scan um, time frame in many cases. So that was interesting. Finding like, like there was one scanner that kept popping up at like 7.03 a.m. I thought that was the most interesting thing. I'm like, why 7.03 exactly? I wanted to like um, ping the guy and say, why 7.03? Um, well, but that, that's, that's 9 a.m. Central time. After you get your cup of coffee, it's like. Yeah, but 03, like what's yeah. wrong with your cron job or something? Or are you, looking at so many sites that it takes three minutes for you to get through the beginning of that scan job who knows right so all these things become interesting details that you start to get fascinated with when you have the data and when you start to pull apart the adversary intent here it's like why are you scanning me is it just to scan me what are you trying to learn um, some cases you know uh, from the front end of your sites from the front end of your company Folks can learn, like, how often do you patch? What component parts do you go after? You know, how much do you spend on your website development? There's lots of things that you can learn, and it doesn't actually require anything more than a scan. So I thought that was really interesting data. And scanners are, you know, the beginning of the, the phase. But I also feel like scanners need to improve to start to have that dimensionality. Researchers, I think, are really interesting. Like you can see, like researchers don't give up. They're constantly doing things. They're doing attack tooling. Uh, they were looking for private files. Um, this particular application must have just given them tons of signatures. It was actually sending out 200s for every private file they were looking for. And the amount of private file information that you know we grokked from this was super impactful, I thought. Um, because it gave us just more understanding of like what researchers were really looking for, why, um, a lot of the research we did actually articulated the Git problem where um, they were looking for actual like Git files and being able to pull through the history of pull requests to learn more about the application that was submitted. So that was a, a really interesting tidbit to learn about what researchers were looking for to be able to help them. Paid noise constantly going off. It hits every different dimension. It looks, it looks a lot more bursty than scanners. When we started pairing this, we did see some of the like researcher stuff actually get paired with some of the noise. So we know that researchers tend to use um, different kinds of tools and they, they hit a, hard, a site pretty hard. So they're using scripts. This is the kind of scripted behavior that you, you would pick up that looks like noise. It's not real action. It also has a lot of um, uh, error codes associated with it that are not positive. And then finally, like your advanced adversaries, a malicious IP, a signal science IP, those were interesting because um, for us, the malicious IP was really easy to determine for threat intel purposes, but some of the signal sciences IPs, like why is this one a concern? You know, we started getting th actual threat intel that we didn't have in some cases straight off of leveraging the telemetry here. And um, this is where I believe that the ecosystem is better by using a lot of different tools together and we're all sharing that information on telemetry in a way that you know makes us better it's actually um, shared intel so that that was also insightful for us yeah that, those are those are the ips that uh or uh, that have been detected for other uh, other signal sciences customers and then flagged inside of your dashboard as well right to say yeah that was the part about benchmarking you know it, people have a hard time sharing intel and they have a hard time sharing these insights so yeah. some interesting insights, like just to kind of take some of that research and kind of put a nice bow on it. You know, um, sig scanning signatures like to whitelist themselves. Like there's a bunch of folks that are, if they're doing scripted behavior, they're actually saying they're white hat, but they're not. They're not coming from the right IPs to be white hat. Um, you know, the bad guys are not using commercial scanners for the most part, um, except for generating noise. They like to generate noise using those tools or um, for whitelisting purposes. Um, they have a few go-to TTPs, so a lot of the traffic that we were seeing was actually pretty specific in different types of patterns, but for the most part, the number of exploits that were being leveraged were um, quite small, and so those TTPs are just continuously being recirculated under some new banner. Uh, you know, you don't under don't underestimate the value of cryptocurrency mining because um, that seems to be a huge influx now. 
of the capabilities. Like one of the things to pick up is um, I know Apache Struts, uh, there's some Jenkins vulnerabilities out there. Mm -hmm. There's uh, JBoss and Tomcat. Those tend to lead to cryptocurrency mining. So I think that that was kind of important. Yeah, and I put a link in here. We just just this uh, last uh, Struts vulnerability that came out of what a week or two two weeks ago. Yeah, exactly. Um, we we saw like um, across our customer base, we saw that pivot from just like um, you know pinging and trying to like see if the exploit's valid to like trying to like put in cryptocurrency payloads, um, and we saw that within. Um, I don't know within 36 hours of the of the the thing being announced, right? Like we, yeah. we started, I'm just ballparking a number there. It might have actually been sooner than that, but uh, just from memory. But it, it was it was really rapid, like how quick, like it got not just discovering to like let's let's payload this thing out to a crypto uh, mining thing. So uh, that's a real deal. That's right. So they're also not afraid of using AIML. They tend to use a lot of it. They're actually harnessing it to be able to create the right patterns and signals, and they hide a lot in the noise. Yep. Uh, hey, and Shannon, on time check, we, uh, yes, we, we have, have about 10, 10 minutes, minutes left, left, and we got to speed it up. We'll, 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 uh, we'll fly through this next section, and then we'll try to leave still a few more minutes for, uh, for questions yeah. here. Um, okay, so I think Measurements, you know, they vary, um, and I think every, we got to realize every application is different uh, by the, the vertical. Um, you know, what development language it's written, uh, what its purpose is. Um, we we did some research at Signal Sciences, and we uh, were looking at like what are uh, what are some aspects around attack uh, attack account takeovers that we could look at, right? So just these are some failure rates uh, for just a normal failure rate across all of our the people that we analyzed for this research. Uh, we saw about 33 uh, percent or so. Uh, if they were external applications, uh, they were, that was a normal failure rate for like auth failure. Uh, we saw for internal, it was, it was uh, remarkably different, uh, just like a 9% failure rate. Um, so this just means like someone logs in and like they, or they can't remember their password and so they fail and they got to retype it in. Um, so if they're internal users, like that's a different, uh, it's a different vector. Um, also uh, by industry, we saw, saw a wide variety of what's normal. Um, um, I was talking just um, to some friends who are like, oh, yeah, I never remember my passwords. I just always reset my password every single time I log into the app. And I'm like, oh, okay. So you can see some of that more on the commercial or uh, consumer type apps on the right hand side, on the left, um, you know, financial, like uh, people forget their banking password a lot less um, than, than, uh, um, than the they gaming. forget their e-commerce e thing or their gaming password. Super. Yeah, that's an impactful yeah. piece of data too. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. And the other piece that that sort of uh, threw me for a loop that I didn't think of, uh, um, maybe because uh, you know I'm maybe sometimes naive about the world, but I thought, oh yeah, well like an auth failure, like you would always just return like you know a, you know even just return a 400 level code, right? But um, all all apps are coded differently, uh, different frameworks, language, all that stuff we talked about. So sometimes if you fail a login, like you get a 200 um, HTTP 200 code or a 300, like a redirect code or a or uh, or you get one of these uh, you know 400s or you know 401, which is unauthorized. So we thought this was interesting, the distribution of how applications handle uh, failure. So we we uh, we know like you need to have some flexibility in how you take these types of measurements. Um, and so, Shannon, like whenever you do measurements, like I know you kind of had, you have some extra stuff on how you think about measurements. Like what, what's your guidance here? Yeah, so guidance wise, like go look for a return rate. Figure out how often your adversary is returning. Do the dimensional analysis of putting it on a graph. Try to do it every 30 days. Like adversaries have a specific pattern. Ours looks like a interesting hockey stick where there's lots of little adversaries that come in for about a day some you know return for quite some more time and basically our job is to make sure that they go away and understand those patterns and so that helps to constantly be chasing the right adversaries to understand how to eradicate them from an environment um, you know the rate of change is also important you know how often do your adversaries change their tactics so that can tell you about their ROI. If they're stuck to a specific attack, you could do a very small thing to disrupt it. And they may not be willing to change. They just may be willing to go on to the next um, and the next and the next site. Uh, another thing is, you know, what's the cost of a fix for the um, adversary? How confident are the adversaries that the cost of fixing for you is actually pretty high so that they know that they're gonna be um, wed to something that's gonna allow their ROI to increase. So figuring out how to reduce your cost of time to fix or um, ability to fix is really impactful. And then also mean time to identification. How long do you have to find an issue or how long do they have to find an issue? So if an adversary spends 
you know, three days finding an issue and it sits around that issue spends, you know, 200 days on average sitting around that they have a lot of time to be able to do something with it. So if the meantime to identification on their end, it, it takes longer. This is where you could maybe create deception capabilities or something of that nature to make it much harder for them to find um, impactful events and capabilities for them to leverage. Uh, that has a return to be able to get rid of your adversaries. And again, you know, the interest here is really with these measurements, you're trying to hone your productivity capabilities from a, a development standpoint, and you're ultimately leveraging this data to drive that. Like if you look at this uh, slide here, what you're seeing is basically you have some sort of average time spent. And that means that if you can keep something under one day, most of the time or up under sub hours, you're gonna have the uh, benefit that most adversaries are actually coming in, finding nothing and going away. So they don't find you to be that interesting. Um, for the ones that come in and stay for longer, those are the areas that you have to spend the time on. And sometimes you create deceptions. So you want to find out how sticky a deception is. You know, the other parts of this hockey stick are about how long can you keep somebody on your side if you are creating a deception? How long do you waste their time? Because ultimately that's going to cause them to believe they're becoming successful, but to no end. Hmm. So also last thing, mean time to identification. So really being able to look for a change in your environment. This goes back to like CICD, being able to test when something's created. If it takes you a long time to identify it, but it takes them a really short time to identify the change, then you know your security tests are not effective. And so you want to make it so that your security tests are actually finding the most important thing when it actually comes out. Okay, so what's our what's our third point here? I mean Third uh, point kind of is, this. I was going to yeah. say, we could probably cover this in one or two minutes here. Um, the third point is, I'm passionate about DevSecOps. I want to make something really easy for developers. I'm interested in making it um, continuously corrected. We've reduced some of our programs down to five um, major categories using the hierarchy of security needs. And, you know, apps are and data are as safe as where you put it, what's in it, how you inspect it, who talks to it, and how it's protected. This is kind of the basis of adversary interest mining and, and really putting that together. If you're interested in some of this section, I would say there's been talks previously that um, I've provided, other people have provided in DevSecOps days, and um, you can definitely hear a whole bunch about DevSecOps and continuous remediation at speed and scale. So the next slide is a little bit about like bringing in data and how to keep pace. You know, we bring in terabytes of data a day. Um, thankfully, we've got more and more vendors that are providing greater levels of um, instrumentation and telemetry that's helping to speed that up. Next slide. So the other thing I would tell you is start looking upstream. Like I tend to tell people that the C's for your upstream, like when you have a great idea for a customer, but it's poorly implemented, it starts at ideation and it works its way towards deployment. So the C idea at the beginning tends to degrade as it gets deployed. It also tends to degrade over time. So the sooner you find it in your pipeline, the better um, chance you have of uh, remediating it and not having it become impactful to your organization. And, uh, I, and through two slides in here, just because I thought they'd be helpful to think about as um, as we think about uh, you know attackers and understanding our adversaries, um, we have the Signal Sciences NLX, which uh, kind of the precursor to that was those SIGSI uh, bad IPs, but um, it's our the Network Learning Exchange, um, and it helps us uh, it surfaces threats across all of our customers. So it's um, uh, it, it's it, it's validated across um, kind of the network, like what we talked about uh, earlier. Um, and additionally, we have um, what's what we call power rules. Uh, this is so that you don't have to be a developer or and you don't have to be an in-depth security person to be able to configure this. Um, you don't have to you know rewrite a bunch of your application to uh, to monitor this, but you can instrument any part of your HTTP transaction. Um, and uh, you can see kind of the, the how this all fits together there. Um, but it's it, it even works for like applications that you don't control the source code for. So like your your WordPress example, right? Or you want to just instrument any type of it you, uh, of the app, you totally can. And so we find that to be uh, really helpful for folks, especially when you're looking for things with a wide variety of of uh, a way that they handle stuff like account takeovers, uh, off off failures, password resets, or um, if you, any any part of your application that you're interested in in uh, 
instrumenting for abuse or, or any of those pieces, like you can do that with uh, signal sciences power rules. So I uh, just thought I'd put a little plug in there and that uh, that's easy and it kind of expands those boundaries of developers, operations and security. Okay, so for the future, uh, I think we're, we're running uh, out of time here, but um, you know, we, we think that you can kind of crawl, walk, run here. And Shannon, that's that's kind of your, your punchline. Um, you know, what do we say for crawl? So for crawl, you know, I, I see a few questions here. How do you find the adversaries? Start to instrument your code. So some of this is around getting logs to come in, starting to look for like OSINT, which is um, uh, basically free threat intel. Uh, starting to pull those patterns together, you're going to get the headers for your application. In smaller applications, you probably have access to your um, web server for folks that are leveraging signal sciences. You have the ability to start seeing that traffic right away. Um, adding the telemetry over time, you can start to understand the patterns. Like we do a lot of regex on the headers associated with the attacks. You can see them directly in the header patterns. And then, you know, finally, like um, running, you, you want to figure out how to forecast. Like one of the things that um, we are starting to do is predict what traffic's coming at us, what attacks are going to come at us, and being able to forecast, like, hey, we know that this attack scanner is going to come back every day and it's going to have these specific, you know, signatures, and we can actually tell you when it's going to change as a result. So those, those are interesting things. Um, you know, the top 10 comparison that comes out, you know, I think that it's really important for you to get the exact adversary pattern of your application figured out as quickly as possible. All right, well, uh, I, I think this is great. I've, Shannon, thanks for kind of coming on here and doing this. This has been uh, really interesting. I, I've loved kind of your research and the adversary thing. Um, I have a couple takeaways for folks. If uh, you have questions for us, but you know, we obviously went a little bit over on time here. You can reach out to, uh, there's the Twitter handles at the bottom, DevSecOps uh, is Shannon. Yeah, please uh, send your it. questions there. We're happy to answer them. Yep, just uh, tag us on those. Um, we'll be happy to answer. We'll be watching that uh, all day long and just sort of uh, reply back on that. Um, Shannon and I are also giving a talk at DevOps Enterprise Summit um, here uh, in October if you have a chance to do that. Um, and then we also have uh, a Signal Sciences uh, ebook guide uh, that you can check out. And it's over at info.signalsciences.com slash book. Um, in it, we've written some stuff kind of around the same type of topic. Um, uh, you know, obviously not all of Shannon's, uh, you know, amazing adversary research, but uh, uh, if you're interested in that, maybe this would be it for you as well. So thank you everybody for your time today uh, and hope you have a good rest of the day.